Good evening, everybody. Welcome from the Adventures Club of Los Angeles. My name is Chuck Jonke, and I'm uh, member 1026, and here to introduce to you, uh, I'm actually doing this in, in lieu of our first vice, pre vice president, Ken Hudson, but Ken Hudson is sitting right here. So do you want to interview yourself, or how do you interview this? I mean, you could do a split screen and say, hey, Ken, how are you doing? I do talk to myself a fair oh. amount, but... <laughs> so anyways, I'm sitting, I'm filling up his shoes, my shoes are not quite as big, but anyways, Ken, <laughs> so good to have you tonight. And, uh, oh, thank you. We're going to be talking about adventure, or better said, misadventure. Yes. And as we all know, um, some of the best laid plans sometimes go haywire. So uh, Ken is a very successful businessman, and he's very well known in the tiki trade as Ken Tiki, <laughs> and has made millions and millions of dollars in the, the world yes. of tiki. <laughs> Or at least he would like to. As evidenced by my and custom he loves, tailored. He loves skulls. <laughs> so um, he's a, a fun, interesting, and a bit strange guy. <laughs> so Ken, um, let's jump into uh, who, what, where, when, and why of this uh, adventure. In 1991 it began, I believe. Yes. So this was um, a few years into our marriage, about four years. Yes. <laughs> and uh, we had... We had traveled to Europe on our honeymoon, and that was probably my largest adventure out of, outside of backpacking and other things I did uh, when I was younger. And uh, so that was kind of my exposure to the world at that point. And uh, it was exciting and fun, but uh, my wife Gloria started getting antsy because she's been traveling since she was 12 or something, or <laughs> younger probably. and. Uh, she had been a, a lot of places I had never been, and uh, she wanted to go someplace new and exotic that she hadn't been before, which narrowed the list down considerably. And uh, so she started shoving this National Geographic in front of me periodically, and uh, said, "Wouldn't this be cool to see?" And I and I saw these ancient temples, and I thought, "Wow, that would be really cool to see." And on the other side of the page was this guy standing there with one leg blown off, leaning on a crutch, and they were talking about the plethora of landmines <laughs> that were all over Cambodia, which is where we wanted to go. And uh, so it wasn't a great sell to start with. And uh, so she kept working on me, and she said, well, you know, my brother and his wife are going to go. They're experienced travelers. My, my mom's going to go. She's experienced. So you'll have all these experienced travelers around you as a support team to go. And uh, if things go wrong, well, you know, we'll figure it out. So uh, over the course of, uh, we said, OK, let's go ahead and book it. We couldn't book it through a US agency. Um, Cambodia had just opened up for tourism. They were. Um, they were forming a trilateral government at the time, which was um, part of the royal family, uh, part of the Khmer Rouge representatives, and um, another interested party that I don't recall off the top of my head. But uh, basically, the country was full of UN troops at the time. And when you flew into the airport, the half of the airport was full of these big UN troop transport carriers. And uh, so, now, you knew this all going before you went down, that this was uh, kind of not exactly a war zone, but it was not the... Yes, we did. <laughs> so that, that was part of my trepidation about the whole thing. I, I guess I have one question. Is, yes. <laughs> and that is, your relationship was going okay with your wife, and your in-laws, did they like you very much? Or was uh, this like yeah, well, a way to get rid of you? Or? Yes. <laughs> it did pass through my mind that, well, yeah, just step off the trail over here. <laughs> But uh, we decided to give it a go. And so it was booked uh, a few months out. And as we got closer, well, uh, her brother's wife ended up having to have some back surgery. And that, so that took them out of the equation. And uh, I think it was within a, a week or two of our departure date, her mom came down with a, a super bad cold yeah. and had to cancel. So I'm going, well, I guess it's just you and me. <laughs> and so we went. And um, so we landed in Bangkok. 
Um, the first time I'd been there, uh, was a transit point for all things Asia from there. So uh, I remember getting off the plane. We arrived at night, opened the door, and the, the humidity just hits you like a wall. <laughs> and this was, this was like 9 or 10 o'clock at night. So by the time we got out, got, got our baggage and, and got a taxi to the hotel, we walked up to the counter and said, okay, we're here to check in. And they start looking through the book and they're going, um, well, we're not finding you, right? <laughs> and so we're going, well, can you look again? And so they get in the computer and they said, oh, um, it was canceled. Going, so we don't have a room for you. So this was, this was the start of <laughs> the big adventure. And uh, so we thought, well, right, can you help us find another hotel? Because there was no way to call the, the travel agency. They're closed. It's nighttime. They're on the same sure. time zone as where we were. So uh, it, we called and left messages, but obviously they had no way to get hold of us except at the hotel. And so we ended up, they found a room for us at another hotel. And we had to get up early the next morning. And um, well, we had a couple days there and we were never able to get hold of uh, the travel agency to see whether the rest of the trip had been canceled or not. And so we just decided, well, we'll just go to the airport with our plane tickets and see if they work. <laughs> so I remember in the, in the taxi on the way to uh, the airport, the taxi driver asked us, where are you headed? And we said, well, Laos. And he turned around and looked at us like, are you insane? They eat children there kind of reaction. And you can tell there's this big hostility between, between um, the Thai and, and the Laotians. And pretty much, pretty much all those countries all have a long history of hating and killing and being at war with each other. So even to this day, there's distrust. But to have a Bangkok taxi driver tell you you're crazy for going into the country, is <laughs> he's seen a few things and yeah. puts a little different baseline on it. So we ended up, the plane tickets worked. We got there. Uh, they took us in, uh, got a taxi to the hotel, and the hotel had us on the list. So we thought, all right, we're golden for this part. We don't know where we're going from there, if any of the rest is still working. But um, So you flew just from, from Bangkok into... Into Laos. So we went to Laos. It was uh, Bangkok to Laos to Cambodia to Vietnam and then back to Bangkok. And Same out. airline? Um, I believe it was. I think it was, may have been Thai Airways. Okay. I'm not sure. Uh, pretty limited choices in that <laughs> at the time anyway. And so we ended up um, starting to do our tour thing and it was it was that morning when we woke up in the hotel and it was um, we just heard this banging on the on the door right and we kept looking around trying to figure out where the noise was coming from and then looked outside and realized there was a bee about that big around <laughs> that kept flying against the screen <laughs> on the screen door trying to <laughs> trying to come visit. And we're like, okay, well, I'm glad there's a screen. Um, we ran into a lot of giant insects in our <laughs> hotel rooms from that point on. Uh, seems to be a thing. Um, so we went out and did some tour thing, tourist things, uh, small group, you know, four people mostly, and... Uh, most of the most of the transport at that time in in those countries were little Russian minivans that would hold four to six people if you really were good friends, and uh, most of them were not in very good shape. So we went out and uh, we ended up uh, in the middle of town. Uh, there's a big um, monument in the center of Benchon, and we blew a tire on the bus. So uh, I think there's a picture of it there somewhere. Probably number <laughs> number one. Anyway, so so he didn't really have a spare tire or any way to get one. <laughs> so 
So he called up a friend and hopped in a car and disappeared, said, I'll be back, you know, and so we, we probably spent two or three hours walking around this area, took a lot of pictures of chickens, you know, because that's <laughs> pretty much all there was. Um, there was a uh, temple there uh, that is a uh, World Heritage Site, I believe, which is, uh, if, if I've got it right, it contains one of the thumbs of the Buddha. Mm. So um, we didn't learn that until the next day when we drove by it again and they pointed it out and told us what it was or we'd have spent more time looking at it. <laughs> uh, anyway, the guy finally came back and um, with a different vehicle and we all piled in and he said, you know, he's very apologetic because we'd missed half a day of doing stuff. And so he said, I want to make it up to you and I'm going to take you to dinner tonight. And so um, he dropped us at our hotel, let us get some of the sweat off of us and uh, came back to pick us up. And we drove for probably uh, well over an hour out into the countryside. And it starts turning into basically just rice paddies and small, you know, small buildings out there. And we ended up at this restaurant, which was small building with a bridge out to a deck that was built in the middle of a fish pond. And so we had a we had a great dinner there. I think there's a photo of yeah. So that's a that was kind of the view and. Um, they gave us a, a really nice spread of food, um, a wide variety of things that we could try. And um, so we ended up, you know, of course we had to know what everything was. You know, the fried fish was fairly obvious, but you had all these soups and stews and things with mystery meats in them. And so we started asking, <laughs> you know, what was in these? And, and, and they were able to describe everything in there except one, because there's a little language barrier. And so we ended up um, we ended up going back and forth over this stew that had this sort of grisly meat in it. And um, so he goes, just a minute, you know, and he disappears into the kitchen. He comes back with the chef. And he had some words with him, kind of pointed, and he goes, oh, you know, nodded, disappeared, comes back with a little plate. And it had a a foot with claws on it, on the plate. <laughs> and uh, so after we had over being sorry we asked, um, it, it looked kind of scaly and we never did figure out exactly what it is, was, but we're guessing that it was a pangolin. Oh, pangolin. So we've probably contributed to the uh, demise of the pangolin population. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it tasted fine. I mean, it was mostly just, you know, it was spiced with various things, and okay. but it was kind of gristly and not very good <laughs> otherwise. You know, foot soup, I, I lived in Peru for a couple of years, and at one time I was given a bowl of soup, and it was a, a chicken foot, just a chicken foot in the soup. So it's chicken foot soup, so I guess you get pangolin soup. And mm -hmm. <laughs> so those soups are uh, out there. Yeah. So we learned they were an endangered species after we got back, and uh, now I know why. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, we ended up uh, finishing out our, that portion of the trip and we caught a plane to um, the provincial capital, which is Luang Prabang. And um, there's a photo of some monks, I think. And, um, oh, actually, yeah, let me talk about the uh, airplane. As we went to the airport to go to Luang Prabang, we were there just in time for our fly, and we were told, oh, you have to wait. So we look out on the, on the uh, scene before us, and there's this huge military rollout, plane parked right in front of the terminal and red carpets, and there's this guy in a suit standing out there with all the TV cameras on him and everything, and um, we go, what's going on? And they said, oh, that's the premier or whatever they called him, you know, leader of the country. And he's flying somewhere to have negotiations with someone over mm -hmm. some topic. And so um, they finished this whole big military show and big procession up to the stairs, and he gets most of the way up the stairs, and he stops. 
he turns around and he, he leans over to someone and says something and all of a sudden there was a big flurry. And this guy he talked to goes running down the stairs and across the field to one of the cars parked there and comes running back with a briefcase <laughs> and hands it to the guy. And I'm thinking that guy probably lost his job <laughs> shortly after that. <laughs> kind of took away from the pomp and circumstance a little. So anyway, we ended up uh, finally getting him out of the airport and we got on our plane and flew to Long Propong. And um, we got there, beautiful location. Um, we, um, we had an interesting, uh, it, we ended up catching a uh, boat from where these monks were. Uh, this was in Long Prabang, and we were walking down to the river to, to uh, meet up with one of the boats. And, and these are the long boats with the, you know, four banger engines on a pivot point with a long drive shaft yeah. that'll do 30 miles an hour on <laughs> smooth water. Um, so we went, we went down the river and visited various villages, which were fascinating. Uh, they were, one made rice wine, or uh, actually rice alcohol, because they were distilling. Stunk like crazy. Mm. Uh, rice alcohol figures in later. <laughs> uh, we went to a village that did, um, half the village was standing out in the shallows of the river. Uh, sloshing water in pans and uh, they were gold mining, gold panning. So apparently there's a fair amount of gold in where they were located, so they were dipping and, and doing the uh, panning thing. Mm -hmm. And so that's what they made their living off of. And we went to another village that was um, made their, uh, they did weaving. So each village is very specialized there and they trade amongst themselves. So if you need weaving, you trade a little gold and rice alcohol upriver and um, very interesting to see how specialized they were. This is on the Mekong? Yes, Mekong River. So you know, we were walking around, uh, walking around one of the villages and I kept noticing little splots of blood on the ground or what appeared to be blood. And uh, so I was thinking, well, they must have just taken out a chicken, you know, or something, but it was everywhere. And uh, we were watching the village build a house for a newlywed couple, you know, it was interesting. And uh, and I finally turned around to the guide and I kind of pointed to the splots on the ground. He goes, ah, you know, he goes over and he drags over this older woman who smiled a big smile of black teeth and, and frothy red saliva. Spitting. It was betel nut. <laughs> so very common there. Everybody chews it. Everybody it's, has black teeth, and there's times. and there's red splots everywhere. So um, it's not it's not really blood, but they spit it. It looks just like yeah. It looks like it's color of blood, but right. it, yeah, it's a product of the nut they chew. It's it's a slightly slight narcotic effect. It's like heavy duty chewing tobacco, maybe. Um, and it totally destroys the teeth. Yeah, not good for the teeth. <laughs> Uh, we stopped at a stopped at a Buddha cave where uh, Gloria got attacked by a monkey. <laughs> tried to take tried to take what there was of our lunch, and uh, so we packed up. Ended up coming back and got ready for the next day to to go out. And um, so the next morning we head out to um, there are these falls, and. Uh, if you can show the picture of the waterfalls. So, so these waterfalls are spectacular. I think they're some of the pools as well. Um, this is like Havasupai or other places you might go where the water is just turquoise and clear, uh, beautiful setting. And so um, on the way out there, we we stopped in several villages and uh, met people. And um, I remember driving over a bridge, and our particular our van that day had a large hole in the floor. <laughs> yeah, I mean you could see the road. And I remember driving over a kind of a rickety wooden bridge that had a giant hole in it where a bomb had been dropped on it 20 years prior, and they'd never fixed it. So it was interesting to drive over this bridge and look down through the truck, through the bridge, down to the water down below. <laughs> um, 
you know, we stopped in these villages and it was, um, for me who had never really been out of Western culture particularly, it was, it was very eye-opening. Um, because the one village in particular had, um, there was a, a gunboat of some kind that had been shot up and, and banked. What it was doing in Laos, I'm not sure, but I guess we were places we shouldn't have been. Uh, and there were a lot of kids just running around in, you know, if they had clothes, they maybe had a pair of shorts or something, uh, barefoot, no shirts, whatever. And they were just fascinated by us. You know, they all gathered around and, and um, it, it was, uh, the other couple we were with had, had brought uh, just some uh, bubbles, you know, the little bubble blowing kit you get for 10 cents at the store. And they just started blowing bubbles and they were, they had a great time watching that and they just gave it to them and they all ran off. But I remember one kid standing there with a, uh, a spent rifle shell, right? And he was just, he made a whistle out of it. He was just blowing in the end of it and he was just happy as could be. And it, it was, it was kind of a revelation for me that you don't really have to have anything to be happy. <laughs> you know, all these things that we, that we have, and I, I'm guilty, I've got all kinds of toys, but um, to be able to see people find happiness in really simple things and just living life like that was, was something just out of my realm of thought. It's fun that. to see kids around the world build little toys out of anything, you know, yeah. seed pods or sticks or whatever, and just have a great time. So um, we, we stopped in a couple of those, and then we ended up going to these falls, and, and we had to park. Um, there was a parking area where you could pull over and, uh, and then take a trail up, and it was about a, I'm going to guess, about a half-hour walk, um, and it was up a hill and pretty bad trail. I mean, it was, you know, trails like that maybe, and it was steep on both sides and kind of muddy and slippery, and so... We hiked in, uh, and there was a point where we had to cross a, a little stream uh, to get to the other side to get onto the falls. So, being lazy, we didn't take our boots off. You know, we didn't want to have to. That was before I discovered slip-on <laughs> boots. <laughs> yeah, we didn't want to have to unlace our hiking boots, and so you know, we just got a good running start and jumped across, and and it's fine. So, we went on. We hung out at the falls for a while, and. Um, took a bunch of pictures and enjoyed ourselves and then started coming back. On the way in, there was kind of a nice straight section of trail leading up to the creek where you could get a little running start and hop over. And um, on the way back, the trail took a little turn right there. Mm. And so there was no running start to be had. <laughs> and so, Again, we were lazy and didn't want to take our boots off, so we thought, well, we'll try to jump it. So I jumped over, and it's fine. And uh, I was standing there waiting for Gloria to jump across, and she made the jump, and there was a rock there, uh, which turned out to be pretty slippery and mossy. And that's what her foot hit, and she slipped and went down. So in going down, she knocked my legs out from under me, and... Um, her leg, her lower leg fell between two rocks, and I fell Yikes. right in the middle. <laughs> and uh, she made some unpleasant noises, <laughs> and, and then uh, crawled. You know, we both crawled out of the water and and started trying to stand up, and she couldn't stand up. And so um, we decided that well, it's just sprained, right? Just. Just tough it out, we'll wrap it up, we'll get back to the bus and we'll be fine. And she started standing up, trying to stand on it. She goes, no, this is not right because when she put the weight on it, that one foot just started turning. Yeah. And so, <laughs> so we go, okay, this is not just a sprain. So um, out came the Boy Scout skills. <laughs> I had bandanas, I had uh, wrapping tape with me and I had um, a Swiss Army knife back when you could carry such things. <laughs> and uh, so 
I went and found a couple of sticks, strapped them to the side of her leg and, and wrapped it up and, and we started trying to limp out and she was leaning on me and, and the trail was not good. Just the two of you at the time? Yeah, because the rest of the group had gone on ahead, yeah. of course. So they were all down there cussing us out probably for being late. <laughs> so um, we started trying to get down the trail and she was limping badly and leaning on me and there were points where she just literally had to sit down and kind of scoot down the trail mm. uh, for steep parts. And uh, so we finally got down close to where the, the van was parked and our guide was coming up the trail with a little bit of panic look on his face. And so when he saw what was going on, that her leg was all wrapped up, he just had sort of a panic attack. <laughs> um, guides, I don't remember what the exact dollars were that the average person made in a month there, but guides make about six times that. Wow. And I could, he could just see those dollars just burning and flying off in smoke, <laughs> I'm sure. Uh, so anyway, they said, okay, we should go to the hospital back in Long Prabang. And so, you know, everyone's kind enough to divert and say, yeah, let's just skip the rest of the trip that day. And we ended up at the Long Prabang Provincial Hospital. So this is an old colonial building. And it, I mean, I don't know how old it actually was, but it looked like a hundred years old. <laughs> you know, all covered in mildew and, and missing roof pieces and all that fun stuff. And uh, so we pulled up in the van and um, guide ran inside and, and comes out with a couple of kind of orderlies or assistants of some kind. And they bring a, um, a gurney out, right? just a metal gurney, no pad or anything. And so they're telling her, oh, get up on the gurney. Well, she can't even get out of the car. <laughs> but I'm looking at the gurney and going, okay, there's there's fresh blood and hair all over this gurney. <laughs> I'm thinking, no, we're gonna, we're gonna find a different way to do this. And um, so in the end, we ended up getting her into the exam room and, um, and they started trying to cut um, all the tape off that I had put on. And so they grabbed this pair of scissors. It's like a pair of sewing shears, you know, like that. Well, they had one blade and one sort of a third of a blade. <laughs> and they were trying to cut through the tape. And so I just grabbed my Swiss Army knife again and cut that all off. And, and they poked and prodded. And, uh, you know, we already knew it wasn't a compound fracture and that it wasn't, a, you know, a complete break. Um, so they decided, well, we should do an x-ray. And so I ended up having to go into town with our guide to go buy, buy x-ray film on the black market because there was the hospital didn't have any. Now, was this the best hospital in town? It was the only hospital the only. in town. <laughs> it was both, the best, the worst, <laughs> and the only. <laughs> and um, it was, so we ended up having to go buy some x-ray film because they didn't have any. And um, we came back and uh, the doctor that they had there was a Cuban doctor. So the, doctor, the other doctors or nurses didn't speak English or any other language. And so fortunately I could talk to him a little bit in Spanish. Right. So we got some idea what was going on and, and so we decided to go take an x-ray. Well, by that point they had a wheelchair so we went down this hallway and we're just walking through these open wards and I'm thinking, you know, it, there are probably 50 people in these open wards, so if someone comes in with a disease, everybody in that ward's gonna have it eventually. Mm -hmm. And um, so we go to where the x-ray was, and it was these massive wooden doors, right? And it, it was like going into, literally like going into Frankenstein's lab. <laughs> <laughs> because these doors, you know, people didn't get x-rays. Right? And so they, kind of open the squeaky doors, you know, and there were literally cobwebs oh. on the doors. And we went into this room and there's this x-ray machine that's, um, we, were, we were talking about it trying to figure out how old it was. And we're guessing it was, I don't know if they had them in the 20s, but maybe 30s at best. Um, 
and or Russian made, not sure. But it was clearly an antique. And uh, so we got her up on the table and by now a whole lot of the villagers are like, you know, who hang out at the hospital because there's nothing else to do, have all kind of gathered around because they've never seen an x-ray <laughs> done before. So our guide and a couple of the people from the hospital and, and probably four other villagers are standing there around the foot of the bed, right? And she's asking for, she's going, do you like a lead vest? And, <laughs> and they go, oh, yeah, uh, we'll get you one. So they go and give her a lead vest, and she goes, you might want to leave the room. <laughs> Meanwhile, they're all standing there watching to see what's going to happen. And gonna... she's a nurse, right? So I mean, she yeah. knows what's... Oh, yeah. <laughs> so she was, she was horrified by it. Sure. So she said, well, all right, I'm going to, uh, you know, we'll get the x-ray, but you might not want to be around. And these guys were all watching to see what magic thing was going to happen. Of course, they didn't see anything. But, right. but when they threw the thing, you heard the, and, all, and the lights dimmed, right, in the room. So it was, it was kind of crazy. So we went back to the exam room, and uh, they... They got the film developed, so half an hour later they come out with this film and go, okay, well, they're pointing to it, and, it's, and it was a spiral break, right? So it had, it had twisted and, and split and opened up. Mm -hmm. So that's why when she was putting the pressure on it, it would, it would twist open and it would hurt. Yeah, so I um, said, okay, let's, uh, you know, we're not thinking about what we're going to do about the rest of the trip. We just want to get it under control for the moment. And so they... Um, I said, okay, well, um, we don't have any plaster. I'm like, what, what are you going to do? And so they got this stuff that um, you can still get it. I think, I think hospital supply places carry it, but it looks sort of like a, a thin section of uh, refrigerator racking. And, and they just kind of bent it you know, in an L shape and then wrapped some gauze, packed a bunch of uh, cotton in, and then started pouring rice alcohol in it. <laughs> and so why the rice alcohol? And, well, so it won't grow things, right? It's gonna get putrid or something if you don't <laughs> pour the alcohol in there. So, and of course the stuff stinks. So, and the way they had wrapped it, it actually sort of like was bending it, twisting it open a little. So we go, okay, look, we'll just take whatever they can deliver and we'll figure out something better when we get out of here. And uh, so we said, all right, look, can we, can we pay for something? You know, I mean, we wanna, and of course it's all free, but um, they go, well, do you have anything like crutches? And so we said, so they, they got into a, like a lift up bench and they started rummaging around through a whole bunch of stuff, pulled a bunch of stuff out and they pulled out three crutches and two of them matched. And these are those two crutches. <laughs> so, pretty sure those are teak wood. Made out of nice wood. Nicely made. And um, so, we ended up getting, we said, okay, um, what do we owe you for the crutches? And they said something like $5 or something, because they didn't know. And, and I gave them a 20, and they were like, no, we can't make change. I mean, buy some new scissors. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <With> them, <laughs> you know, splurge. <laughs> um, and I, I, we felt bad about taking their, like, you know, two-thirds of their supply of crutches for the region, apparently. But, um, but we took them anyway. So, uh, of course, the question is, what are the rest of the people? That's probably not the first broken bone that's happened in that village. Yeah. What I, on earth do the people deal with? I don't know. I they must limp around a lot, uh, and use a stick. I, was the Cuban guy pretty competent? Yeah, he did seem pretty sharp. And and uh, you know, Cuba has this outplacement program for their yeah, sure. medical doctors, where they train them and then they send them to other communist countries mostly. Right. right. But yeah, they're actually very well trained, and yeah. and uh, I was glad to have them there. Um, he wasn't able to do much good except tell us what was wrong, but at least we felt like we had the right answer anyway. Sure. Uh, so, 
we ended up back at the hotel. Um, our travel mates knocked on the door and brought us some airline bottles of booze and says, we think you need those, mostly her. <laughs> and so, so we drank them. And um, we, we were trying to use the crutches. She was trying to learn how to do them. And, uh, and the first thing she did was uh, put one on a tile. And they had a piece of rubber on the bottom that was held on by a nail. Well, that nail head is what was actually in contact with the ground. So as soon as she hit the tile, it went out from under her and she went down. And so we uh, said, okay, we have to fix that. So we had a pair of uh, flip-flops there. And these are starting to disintegrate after 20 years. But uh, we cut up some flip-flops and used packing tape to tape flip-flop around the end of it. And that worked great. And uh, so the next morning... It's always good to have tape, plenty of tape yes. and stuff like that. There are certain things you learn that, um, yeah, we always have now. <laughs> and the next morning, we had uh, the guide shows up and knocks on our door, and he goes, you know, he's still apologizing for all of this and, and feeling really bad about it. And he goes, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. I know these hurt your arms. And, and uh, so I had my girlfriend, she, I talked to her, she made some pads. So these. <laughs> These pads on here were hand sewn overnight by his girlfriend. Wow. And uh, they have little tie straps to strap them on. And they even have little pinpoint um, stitches in contrasting color to like quilt it a little bit. So, I mean, that's just priceless. For <laughs> Incredible. And they worked great. I mean, she used them for the rest of the trip and uh, they held up really well. The first yes. of three weeks. <laughs> yes. So, so we had a lot of conversation about uh, whether to continue and, and what to do about, because this thing that she had on her leg wasn't working. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't helping at all. And so we just got creative and um, ended up, remember this, because these are valuable things. It's not the last time I've used it. <laughs> We always carry ace wraps. So we did, a, we did an ace wrap around the ankle and up the leg. Got rid then, of the other stuff, the old. The yeah, old. we took everything off, did the <laughs> ace wrap, and then we had some uh, one liter water bottles. So we cut the, cut the top off one and slid it down the side so we could peel it open, and then wrapped that around on top of the ace wrap. And you could leave the bottom in one of them to fit in the heel and mm -hmm. flip the other side down to form an L shape and then do the same thing on the front side um, to encase it in something rigid and then wrap another ace wrap around it. And that's how she got through the next two weeks. Wow. Um, and it worked really well. <laughs> <laughs> so you decided not to try another better hospital and just to see what... Yeah, well, there was, I mean, we were headed to Cambodia, so, yeah. you know, the odds were pretty low. <laughs> so we, you know, we talked about it. What are we going to do? Are we going to stop the trip and, and go back or what? And um, she was adamant. She, you know, we had no, no trip insurance at that time. So we weren't, you know, we were going to lose any money. There were no embassies in any of the countries we were in or going to. So we couldn't contact them for help. So we're like, you know, let's just, we don't know, A, if we're ever going to get back here or if it'll be the same if and when we do get back here. So let's experience it, go as far as we can and just see how it goes. And so um, we did. And I can't believe she did it, but I'm, <laughs> I had a different level of respect for her of after course. that. Not, not many people would do yeah. that or could do that. So we ended up uh, we ended up flying back from Long Prabang to Vinchon, back to the capital city, and um, you know the first big um, challenge was getting into the airplane because these are the roll up stairs, you know, and you have bulkheads stepping into the plane and all that stuff, and which it's really easy when you have two working legs and nothing in your hands, but uh, on crutches not so much. Uh, we um, we were sitting on the plane. They, they, 
they rearranged us and put us in the back row right next to the door so she didn't have to walk all the way up the aisle. And they were serving Coke, you know, while we were sitting on the, because it was hot, you know, nothing uh, to cool us down. So they were passing out Coke to everyone, and I'm sitting there watching the gals in the galley pour the Coke. And they didn't have, they had glasses, right? Glass, glasses. And so they went up to the front and started serving them first and started working their way back, and then they started going up to the front and collecting the glasses back. And I was watching them in the galley going, they're just wiping these out with hand towels and pouring the next one for the next person. There we go. <laughs> so, so by the time it got back to us, we, no, we'll, we're good, <laughs> no problem. Uh, we flew back to uh, Vinchon and uh, they said, oh, we're really sorry, you know, we're, we couldn't get the same hotel you were in, which was a first-rate hotel that, by the way, had the open Frankenstein light switch right next to the shower. Um, so I'm thinking, well, how much worse could it be? And uh, it actually turned out to be better. No. Because there are no elevators, uh, they put us on the, well, not the ground floor, but the first floor up at the top of the stairs. So she had the shortest distance to go. And it was like a, a VIP room for um, when the communist officials came to visit. Because inside was, you know, they had this big crest on the wall. It, it was hammer and sickle and, um, and it was apparently a really good bed. Um, not so much on the pillows because they were literally a little bit of foam wrapped around a wooden board. <laughs> and then um, the one wall was really just breezeway tiles, right? So it wasn't a solid wall, and it looked over the lobby. Okay, um, that was fine until about 11 o'clock when the entire hotel's family and friends and you, all came in to sleep in the lobby. So there's all this commotion for like another hour or two that you can't avoid hearing because you're, you're 12 feet above it with an open wall. And um, so we didn't get a lot of sleep that night. Uh, I and of course, up, no AC, I guess. Yeah, no. <laughs> a fan? That, no. Okay. That's what breezeways are for. <laughs> so um, I ended up uh, going down to the bar uh, to get her a drink and myself, of course, and uh, brought it back up. And, and she said, look, I, I can't do anything. I don't feel that great. You go out and go do something, right? So I went down to the bar and, and uh, got a drink for myself and there was a, there was a fellow there at the bar uh, who just, I heard English, you know, I started talking to him and uh, turned out he was, a, he was a representative for Hanson Soda. And they were out there looking at uh, shopping the breweries there. They were looking to invest and buy into the breweries at the time. So it just this weird encounter that you would never expect. And um, the one thing I'd wanted to get there, uh, one of the things I collect uh, is opium pipes. Hmm. So, <laughs> um, and I knew they did them there and that, you know, with the hammered aluminum. And, um, so I was kind of out on the street, you know, and looking around for a shop and there was, you know, no way to find one really. And some guy on a bicycle kind of comes up behind me while I'm walking along. And I'm always conscious of people around me, you know, it's just, so this guy's kind of hanging and then he starts trying to speak English to me. And after a while I realized he really just wanted to practice English. Mm -hmm. And so he rode along with me for a while. He goes, what do you want to see? What are you doing? You know, what, can I help you? And, and I said, well, actually. <laughs> I'm looking for opium pipes. And of course, he kind of, <laughs> he interpreted that the wrong way. Right. And uh, I said, no, 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 just the pipe. I don't want anything else. And he goes, oh, okay. So he ended up, um, he ended up taking me to a shop, which was a few blocks away, and, uh, and helped me talk to the shop owner. And, uh, and he gave me his address, and, and we actually corresponded for uh, a while after that, and uh, 
So we ended up um, finishing that out and uh, heading to Cambodia. So we flew into Cambodia, and it was, like I said, at the airport, it was tons of UN vehicles and, and aircraft there. And um, we were in Phnom Penh, and we went to, um, had a nice hotel. Uh, we did all of the tourist things around there, and um, we ended up going to the, you know, the obligatory things or to see the twelve thing. Now, your wife was able to walk for all this stuff? Well, okay, so we, we acquired a wheelchair in Cambodia. Oh, they made wheelchair. arrangements. So the night we arrived, they said, let's see what we can do. And by the next morning, they had a wheelchair. So this wheelchair was made entirely out of teak wood. Huh. And it, was, uh, it had two bicycle wheels for wheels, and it had a single front wheel. So this thing came out to a, uh, a point with a single wheel. Looked like something you'd see in a horror movie, you know, the old creaky haunted thing. And then uh, it was also horribly unstable, hmm. uh, very tippy. And uh, unfortunately on our first... Uh, you didn't bring that back. No, we didn't. <laughs> but we did have to put it on an airplane a couple of times. Uh, when we first went to Angkor Wat, uh, we were going up the main drag, uh, approaching the temple, and it's a, it's a long haul. You know, it's about it's about 400 yards to to get to the temple, and um, so she kept saying, "Well, watch out for the hole. You see that hole coming up?" And I look up and I go, "Yeah, I see that hole out there. Don't worry." And and she goes, "No, no, it's coming up on. It. I'm going. I see it. Okay, leave me alone." And she goes, "No, it's right there." And the front wheel went down in it, right? Because I was looking at the hole out there, and she was looking at the one right in front of us. <laughs> so the wheel dropped in, and she spilled out, and that was that was almost the end of both our trip and our marriage. <laughs> but uh, we recovered from that. Uh, it, we went to uh, while we were in the city uh, of Phnom Penh. Uh, two of the things that you see. Um, one, uh, David, can you bring up the uh, the skull map? Or yeah, so um, Twalsang Prison is a place where people were basically taken by you know when the Khmer Rouge came in, they they rounded up everybody who had any kind of um, intelligence or affiliation with the former government or um, spoke another language or wore glasses or pretty much anything that set them apart or, or tagged them as someone who might have a, a, a bit of free will of their own or education. And so they really targeted education. And so this um, school where this was, um, was turned into a prison. And if you look at the bottom below this map of skulls, uh, you can see some outlines on the floor. Uh, those outlines are where the walls of some of the prison cells were. So if it's not that clear, uh, I'm going to say they're about two or three foot wide by maybe five foot deep. And that was where you resided if you were in prison there. Hmm. Um, but the the fact that they used these skulls of people who had been killed there was just mind bending. The I'd read about uh, uh, you know a lot of the stuff that went on before I went, and so I kind of expected it, but. Um, to actually see it is something completely different. The the disregard, I'm not going to say disregard, but it just didn't mean anything to them, right? I mean, people's remains were used as a decoration and a monument, but it, they were just things. They, you, yeah. It was a shocker. I mean, it's a whole different, you have to rearrange your head to soak it up. and. Um, 
so I think there's another photo of some uh, some pathways. There we go. So this was um, this was a killing field uh, in Chungak, and uh, Gloria didn't make it to this. I don't think I, she was stuck in a van with some toothless guy that kept staring at her. She was pretty upset when I got back from that. <laughs> Because the guide had just wandered off to go chat with his friends, and this kind of creepy guy just came and stood there and tried to engage her, and it was kind of weird. But this um, this field, you know, without really thinking about it too much, you, you okay, the killing fields are out here, around here somewhere, right? You follow the path. So I'm walking down the path, and I am, and I see these kind of pits off to the sides and whatever, and I look down, and they're little bits of colored cloth sticking out of the dirt. Hmm. And then I started to notice, oh, there's like bones sticking out of the earth, out of the pathway, wow. you know? And so, again, just just soaking up the fact that, that so many people were killed, that it was such a fact of life uh, for them, for the ones that survived. And um, I mean, they can't even do anything on, on a, something of this scale. Uh, to do something to, to respect them. So in this location, there's a giant temple that's, I'm going to say it's two to three stories high and probably 15 or 20 foot square. And it's just skulls inside it. It's just skulls stacked the entire uh, height of it. So Sobering experience. Yeah, the, the amount of <laughs> evil that went on with that whole thing. It's just mm -hmm. incredible to so, contemplate. Um, on to happier things. <laughs> so um, we did then uh, hop a plane to get to uh, Sim Reap, which is where Anger Watt is. And um, as we got on the plane, we were getting on the plane, and, and we had this 400-pound wheelchair with us. And we're going, uh, can you put it in the baggage compartment? <laughs> and, of course, there's no English being spoken, right? And there's this guy, big guy, Cambodian guy, who's just looks like a thug. And I, I'm sure he, he was. <laughs> uh, but he was some representative of the government, right? Or that was his, he was in charge of at least the baggage <laughs> or whatever that gave him that bit of power. And... So he try, started trying to extort us. He wanted like $100 to put this thing on the plane. And had we had it, you know, we probably would have, but I, we didn't have that kind of money on us at that point. And so um, he's, we're kind of going back and forth, and I'm kind of pleading with him. And then some guy, I think it was an Australian guy, kind of comes from behind me and kind of steps in between us. And he just starts getting in this guy's face, right? Yeah, um, I have visions of like Midnight Express time in prison <laughs> at this point, and I'm going, don't you know? Don't be pissing this guy off. You know, he's he's the one with the power, not us. And so, anyway, they they went back and forth, and finally the guy kind of backed down, and they loaded the the wheelchair on the plane, and. He turned around to me, and I'm going, you know, because this was all in Cambodian. I didn't hear the <laughs> what was being said. And the Australian he, spoke Cambodian. Yeah. Oh, okay. So he was with the UN. Oh. Okay. So he uh, basically he told me what he told the guy was, look, you know, don't screw with people like that. You know, you're going to scare tourists off. Tourism is your only hope of rebuilding your country. And, you know, he made this argument to the guy, and, and eventually it sort of soaked in, and he backed down. But, uh, you know, it could have gone all kinds of ways. <laughs> but, yeah, but f for his intervention, we might have been still, we might not have got on the plane, or we wouldn't have had a wheelchair at the other end and been able to see or do sure. most of the things we did. So... So we ended up uh, in Siem Reap and going to all the uh, the various temples. Um, 
So this is Angerwad, of course, the, the most famous of them. Um, most people are probably familiar with them through the, uh, the adventure uh, series. Uh, ah, the name oh, is Indiana, Indiana anyway. Jones? No, the, um, the gal. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, anyway. Uh, Laura, so, Laura Croft. Yes, Laura Croft. So just spectacular uh, temples. Uh, and besides dropping glory on the ground at the entrance to it, um, one of the other experiences I had was uh, meeting, uh, there was a, an older uh, woman monk at the, there are some little temples off to the side towards the entrance area, and she was in there. Um, just sitting there watching us, you know, as as I was pushing her, and um, she goes, you know, motions me over, and she 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 starts talking to me. And of course, I don't I have no idea what she's saying, but but she basically kind of goes, you know, and points to her right in the wheelchair, and I <laughs> and I literally did something like this. I'm going, you know. And, and then, <laughs> yeah, there and she go. goes, and I could just see, you know, the reactions on her face and everything. And so, we, it was funny because we had this whole little communication without saying a word, <laughs> and and we understood each other. And um, pretty sure she's the same one that was. I think she was in National Geographic uh, about a few years later, uh, because I'm like, that looks the same person. Yeah. So, uh, phenomenal experience seeing the, the temple. Um, the Anchor Tom uh, ha is just completely overgrown. I think it's the next one after this. Yeah, so um, these massive trees just have enveloped the ruins and grown around them. And you, and you can see that in the movie, you know, with the Lara Croft. Uh, and in some cases, they've both destroyed it and are still holding it together because the roots are just wrapped around. So in this particular location, um, this was this was a lot rougher, and it didn't have a trail all the way up to the temple. So, you know, I wheeled Glory in as far as we could, and we she'd get out of the wheelchair, and and I'd help her over a log, and then hoist the wheelchair. And the easiest thing to do was. Grab, the, grab it by the arms from the front and just hoist it over my head, right, and walk it over and then put it down. Yikes. So we got in as far as we could. She didn't want to stay in the wheelchair. She was sitting on a log or something, and, and I went the rest of the way in and saw all the cool stuff while she had to sit outside. <laughs> um, so I, I did my thing, ran around, saw as much as I could, and then I came back and I walked in on this scene where there are two Cambodian guys standing there, and one of them's got hold of the wheelchair, and he's like, Ugh! and he, he's trying. He had seen me hoist it up over my head <laughs> and put it over, and they were trying to lift it up and over their head to see if they could do it, and they couldn't. <laughs> so they were going back and forth, both trying it, but it was funny, and they saw me coming. I'm going, oh, it's okay, you know. Superman. But, yeah, it was <laughs> funny though. Um, I think there's another picture of the Bayonne, um, which is probably the other most famous um, temple there. So these are uh, these are Buddha Buddha heads carved on four sides of each tower, and the the Bayonne is actually layered. If you go in and look, you can see that it's got um, it's got it's gone back and forth between. Buddhist and Hindu. Mm. So there's a layer here, and then it was overbuilt by something else, and then it was overbuilt again. So you can see the different features in it uh, as things changed. Uh, we were asked if, um, if we wanted to go to another uh, temple that had been discovered more recently and wasn't as well uh, exposed. So we, we said, oh, that sounds interesting. You know, they said, okay, well, 
how many people want to go? And it ended up being like, there were only like three of us, I think, that wanted to go. And they said, well, okay, well, you have to hire the army to take you. And so we said, well, okay, how much is that? You know, and it was just some phenomenal number. You know, had the had we had 10 people to split it up maybe, but there were just three of us and it was it was just too much money. And that and the fact that the army wanted to um, escort us was right, something right. else. <laughs> so we decided not to. Um, and later on when we ended up in Vietnam, uh, we ran into the same guy, the same UN guy that had helped us out mm -hmm. with the flight. He was back in Vietnam staying in the same hotel we were in. Mm -hmm. And uh, he and we were talking about that, and he said, "Oh, there were the, there were still some Khmer Rouge who weren't on board with everything, and they'd gone in and killed some people in that place that we had decided not to go." <laughs> so, it turned out to be kind of fortuitous that we it was too expensive to go. Um, the the bugs in this place, uh, the hotel. <laughs> The hotel was interesting. It was the uh, Grand Hotel de Angkor, and it was, um, I think it was built in the teens or 20s. So at the time it was built, it was a spectacular building. And um, I guess they did, you know, it was a hunting retreat kind of place at the time. And, but when we walked in, uh, we, went, we went to our room and it's always a bad sign when there's mosquito netting over the beds and there's a candle by the <laughs> on the side table by the bed and uh, your hot water was delivered in a big thermos mm -hmm. for any kind of bathing you wanted to do. Yeah. So, uh, uh, large tarantula on the shower window <laughs> looking in and uh, that was a little unnerving when you're showering. <laughs> uh, lots of huge bugs. Uh, centipedes the size of your finger, you know, not that long. So army ants, these were all things I had never really encountered before, but things grow big in humidity, yeah. I guess. <laughs> uh, breakfast was interesting in that hotel because we'd come down in the morning and the hotel was half full of French UN minesweeper troops. So they would come in, you know, they came in, had breakfast, and they were doing their briefings in the dining room, and so They'd, they'd yell over to us, go, you know, in, a, in about an hour, you're going to hear a bunch of explosions. You know, don't be concerned. It's just, you know, we're doing some mine clearing. And uh, so we stayed on the trails <laughs> and didn't wander off of the Walmart places. Uh, interesting experience. Uh, we got through all that, got back, uh, and headed off to Vietnam. And um, they had a... We ended up in a hotel there where we had problems. It was a floating hotel. So a floating hotel is a, is a boat and it's got all these bulkheads. Mm. So you can't just run a wheelchair or do anything to easily get from one end to the other. And they didn't have a wheelchair. We'd had to leave that in Cambodia because it didn't belong to us. And so they said, well, we'll try to arrange for something. And they did. The hotel managed to scrounge up a wheelchair the next day. But that day we were trying to get to our room and they came up with a really creative solution and which was they got one of these big rolling luggage carts, right, that you see, mm -hmm. and they grabbed a chair and put it on there. <laughs> and then Gloria got into it, sat down on the chair, and we just pushed her down the hall into the room. And you could even tip it back to get over the the bulkheads. So Remember that one because yeah. we put that to use again for someone else who who badly sprained their ankle in Cuba, and they were she was trying to figure out how to get the entire length of the hotel and up to her room and back the other length of the hotel. And so he said, "Trust us, try this," and she did. Worked beautifully. So a little improvisation to remember you if you're in a hotel with a broken ankle, works great. Uh, we managed to, we went out and saw the countryside in Vietnam. Uh, we were pretty much down to the two of us at that point. Um, we went out to see the um, 
Kuchi tunnels, uh, which are the guerrilla tunnels that were outside of Saigon uh, or Ho Chi Minh City. And um, you know, we had a wheelchair by that time, but it wasn't a very good one. And so we were going up this dirt trail. You know, it was pretty rough and lots of ruts and jungle all around and amazing experience. You see this guy popping out of the ground. You know, their their favorite thing to do is have all the tourists walk by and and then all of a sudden this guy just pops out of nowhere and scares you. And, and, but that was a reality. I, he gave me a, an appreciation for just some piece of what, you know, the, the veterans must have gone through there. Because you look out from any place, if you're on the river and looking onto the land or anywhere on land, on a road, you can't see more than six or eight feet into the jungle in most of those places. And you have no idea what's around you at any time. And uh, it was, um, at the end of that tour, they came back and said, okay, there's a shooting range, right? Do you want to try shooting an AK or an AR or whatever? And we go, well, that could be fun. You know, I've done it before, but um, how much is it? It was like a dollar a round. And I'm like, no, I'll, you know, <laughs> it's, it's like 20 cents at home. I'll, you know, in retrospect, I should have bought a boatload of it and packed it back because <laughs> you can't buy it for that today. But uh, so we passed on that experience. Uh, it was funny later on watching, a, I think it was about 10 years later, we're watching some news program uh, where, you know, they have their reporters go out and do these little trips. And this guy went to Vietnam, right? And he went to the Coochie Tunnel Complex. And he was stumbling around just sweating and, and complaining about how hard and difficult it was to get up this trail and get to these things. I mean, we did it in a wheelchair, you Shh, we did. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Anyway, we passed uh, great surprise in food uh, because it was a French colony. We mm -hmm. ended up stopping for lunch at one place and it was, um, they had soufflés, wow. right? And that was just a strange thing to find here. But they had chocolate souffle and they had banana souffle, which I had never had before. And that it, that was a great lunch. <laughs> if I could have just eaten five of those, I'd have been good for the week. Uh, so we finished all of our our uh, experiences there. And um, the last night before we were supposed to fly out, I wanted to make a connection with my parents, and so I ended up calling from the hotel desk, and I said, you know, I asked how much it was, a minute or whatever, and they told me, and I'm going, wow, that seems pretty reasonable, right? Well, bear in mind, there's, there's no credit cards there because they don't have any U.S. connections with banking. So all you have is, and you can't use traveler's checks then, and so it was a, pretty much a cash-only thing. So I go, all right, well, that's reasonable. I can kind of take my time a little bit. So uh, I'm not sure who misunderstood who, but I t got a call through to my parents and said, hey, look, we're going to need you to meet us at the airport and help us get home to you know, explain kind of what was going on. This first they'd heard of it, right? So, and she's over in the corner going, get off the phone, get off the phone. And I'm going, no, they said it was this much, you know, so. So, you know, so we went to check out the next morning, and they go, oh, that'll be like $80 or something, right? And by this point in the trip, we were, we were pretty much down to almost nothing. And so we go, wow, okay. So we, like, we gathered our cash and handed it to them, and go, all right, well, we're headed, we're getting on the plane, and we're going to Bangkok, we can hit an ATM or a bank or whatever and get some money, we'll be good, right? Or use the credit card. So um, we go to the airport and they drop us off and leave, right? And we go up to the counter. And, you know, they can see that. So I've got two carry ons, right? And two big pieces of luggage, you know. And uh, so they can see that she's limping along on, on one leg and I'm dragging four bags with me. And, um, and I handed them the two check bags, and and then I'm trying to talk to the gal behind the counter. Go well, look, can I? 
you can see the condition. Can I check at least one of these carry-ons, you know, or whatever? And she's like, okay, yeah. So she takes both bags and throws them on the conveyor and they disappear behind the wall. And then she turns around and she goes, that'll be $80. There we go. I'm like, oh. And literally we had like, about thirty dollars and a watch and you know, some old Kleenex <laughs> at that point, and uh, so we're gonna. I can't. I don't have it. You know, you can have literally everything I have, but that's all I have. And so she starts to get agitated, and I, you know, probably mirroring me. And uh, you know, all of a sudden, she's. I said, "Can you just send the bags back out?" You know. Send those two bags back out. I'll carry them. We'll figure it out. Oh, no, I can't do that. So, so somehow, I don't know if they heard us or if she hit a button under the counter or whatever, but all of a sudden there's this guy there in a, you know, big hat and military uniform and scrambled eggs on his shoulders and stuff. And I'm like, uh-oh, you know, <laughs> we've, we've pushed a button somehow and we're in trouble. And so... You know, I was trying to explain it to him. Of course, nobody's speaking English, so um, I'm going. I, you know, I made a big point of emptying my pockets out and just showing him what I had, you know, and and trying to explain the situation. And and finally, he go, finally he sort of got it, you know. And he goes, "Okay." He took the thirty dollars, <laughs> but. Um, you know, we were at least okay. You know, we were going to get on the plane without all of our luggage. So then now all of a sudden he's all kinds of helpful, right? He wants to help us out. And so the waiting room is upstairs, right? And it's a long flight of stairs. So, so he calls over and he has two of his soldiers come over. And, you know, his soldiers probably weigh about 100 pounds, right? And they go, and he like tells him to carry her up the stairs. <laughs> and it was comical to say the least. And they finally decided this was not a good idea. And so we managed to get it, make our way up the stairs, you know, without their assistance. And um, and we're waiting, you know. And then all of a sudden, it was about an hour. We were waiting. Then all of a sudden, this guy shows up again with a couple of soldiers, and he's like. And he like points at like, come here. And I'm like, oh crap. And what now? <laughs> so, so we had to go all the way back down the stairs, right? Yeah, we're going, uh, are you gonna like hold us here or something? And uh, just, come on. So we end up going out this side door, and uh, he's got his personal staff car, the, f the flags and everything sitting outside the door. And he puts us in it and drives us to the airplane before anyone else goes out there. <laughs> so, so it ended up being a, you know, a helpful thing, a good experience in the end. But, uh, man, that trip was uh, a real um, confidence builder. Let's yeah, say. no doubt about it. Sounds like a, a lifetime in just a few weeks. Yeah. So. Well, that's uh, spectacular and. Uh, Amazing that your wife uh, withstood all that stuff. I mean, man, that's not many people would do that. And what what courage! What uh, what a great time. Yeah. So we yeah. have a time for questions. Anybody have any questions? Uh, I don't know if we have anybody in the chat or anybody here that would like to ask any questions of Ken or Gloria. <laughs> we should do a standing ovation for Gloria. I mean, <laughs> unbelievable. Well, it was an accident. That's what it, I wasn't, she wasn't drunk. She just slipped from our bus. So. That's right. <laughs> well, I mean, she <laughs> certainly made the certainly made the best of it, and even then some. What can you do? Yeah. I did drop her off a ski lift once too. Well, so she's uh, she's pretty convinced I'm trying to kill her, but I'm not very good at it. <laughs> so, first question from the chat is: Did you need any special vaccinations? And as a traveler, do you have advice on where to go and how to get good, effective, or cheap vaccinations? Who? Um, 
Yes, we had uh, an armful of vaccinations for that trip. Um, I, I don't remember exactly what they all were, but uh, yeah, uh, we were both pretty sore for a week or two. Uh, and we were doing the malaria pills and all that fun stuff too. So um, I'm trying to think of, we actually did find a good travel medicine place. Uh, the one we used to go to uh, changed up and left, but uh, I can't remember where the new one is. Healthy Traveler in Pasadena? No, there, although I have heard of that. There yeah. is a very fancy vaccination clinic in Pasadena that's, that's good, but not the cheapest one in town. Yeah. This one was over uh, actually by Del Amo Mall in a medical building there, and they were pretty good about researching and finding the right thing and being able to get them. You know, yeah. it's not everywhere you can get a yellow fever kind of shot. And <laughs> so, healthy travelers claim to fame on their business card is they have more vaccines than any place else in Southern California. Ah. You, know, you know, here's another thing: when you travel, and I got stuck in. Caracas, Venezuela, of all places, to not be stuck in for about 10 days as a result of uh, somebody not telling me a vaccine that I had to get from Caracas going into uh, Costa Rica. Mm. Going to the States, they didn't need it, but it's a yellow fever shot, and I had to have had it 10 days before the flight. Uh. I couldn't get it there any anywhere. So I got stuck in Caracas for 10 days trying to just get out of there. <laughs> had to buy a new ticket. So sometimes they don't tell you that from one country to the next they'll require a vaccination yeah. that they wouldn't for, for other places. And I, you know, I had no idea. So, <laughs> Any other questions? So an, <clears throat> another one from the ether is, you mentioned the malaria pills. Uh, good, good timing. Did you have the vivid dreams from the malaria pills? And do you consider them a recreational narcotic? <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, no, I didn't experience that. <laughs> but yeah, it, mostly just stomach upset, to be honest. <laughs> no, no food uh, problems on the trip. No, uh, actually, I knock on wood. I we've been really fortunate to, but we're we're ultra cautious too about things. Um, so if back it, in those days, it wasn't like you had a lot of options, right? Yeah, I mean, if it wasn't cooked or or bottled beverage. You know, we weren't doing it. We'd sure. go hungry, and we'd we'd always take some food. You know, snacks, peanut butter and crackers, kind of snacks and things, just to, and breakfast bars to augment if you had questionable fare in front of you. <laughs> well. uh, David, anybody else? Last question: Did you have any cu problems with customs and the opium pipes? Uh, no. Uh, we ended up, I ended up coming back with uh, about three of them between, uh, I think I got one in each country. And yeah, as long as there's no residue in it, you're okay. <laughs> well, actually, I have to say, I don't, we didn't really go through customs when we came back. There's one big advantage to having someone with a broken leg in your travel party. Wow. And that's that you get put in a chair and whisked around pretty much everything, and they pretty much take your word for anything. So if you want to smuggle, <laughs> put it in a cast. And <laughs> so yeah, that was, uh, that was one of the best uh, re-entries I've ever had, I think. Uh, we didn't have to wait in line, and we breezed right through. So yes, no customs problems. Well, we're glad you guys made it back, and of course you've been on many trips since then. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, I pretty much whet my appetite for doing uh, less than mundane travel. <laughs> well, folks, it's been a great pl uh, pleasure. Ken, yeah. thanks so much for Thank being here. Thank you. I appreciate it. And we hope you uh, will certainly come back and visit us on our uh, uh, YouTube channel. And be sure to subscribe and, and say a nice thanks to us. Right. Two other things. Quick. Is that our closing music? Okay. We're still live when that's... The, uh, I was saying over dinner, there's an uh, old uh, president, ex-president said uh, that this is the only club in the world where all the members have nothing in common, which I don't think is quite true. I think we're all eccentric. And the other <laughs> thing is, it seems to break down to two categories. Those of us who would not join any other club except maybe the Explorers Club, 
And then those who are more social and outgoing,